Now, this is the thing that I highlighted in the uh, in 027, right, when we're talking about the polonium case. It's the half-life. And half-life is something that you all have uh, come across, I'm sure. Uh, whether you've used this equation or not, I don't know. <coughs> I'm going to have to get a drink in a second if this doesn't go away. Um, but it's a measure of the number of undecayed nuclei in a material as a function of time. So if we start, as in this example, with a thousand <coughs> undecayed nuclei of a radioactive isotope, after a certain amount of time, you'll have half of them left, 500 of them left. Right? So that period of time is what we'd refer to as the half-life. Uh, and then, same period of time later, we would expect on average to see only 250 undecayed nuclei left, right? and then 125 and so on. Right? Now, this is a statistical process. So it is not going to be 500, 250, you know, 125 precisely. This is going to have statistical random fluctuations around that numbers. But if you plot enough of this data out, you will find that um, we can fit to our curve something that corresponds to this, this half-life. So we have a, an exponential function here that's describing the process. Uh, here's the number of undecayed nuclei when we started the clock, so t equals zero, whenever that is whenever you start the experiment. This is the number of undecayed uh, nuclei left after some time t. All right? And the relationship between one and the other is given by this exponential term here. <coughs> so this is essentially saying it's e to the power of minus how many half-lives. Right? The actual amount of time divided by the half-life. So how many half-lives have passed by? That's essentially what the exponent for that exponential is giving it. Excuse me. And if we look at that in practice, uh, this is the sort of measurement you might do experimentally. Um, this is quite an interesting um, nucleus. This is barium-137. Those of you who have come across the term barium meals in terms of using radioactive traces in uh, medical diagnosis, this is the isotope that is being used. Uh, it has a, um, well we can, we can estimate the half-life actually uh, from this plot. So this is the point at which we start our clock going, whatever that might be, doesn't matter. <coughs> it's an arbitrary time, we're just looking at elapsed time. So at different periods of time thereafter, we're counting, again, number of radioactive decays, which is giving us a signal on how many undecayed nuclei are left. Right? One is going to be proportional to the other. Double the number of undecayed nuclei, you're going to double the rate at which you hear um, clicks on your Geiger counter. And you can see that it's scattered around this green exponential curve. So there is some random scatter of our data. This is, uh, this is very much a randomized process. But the scatter of our points lie pretty well on that curve. Um, there is almost always in an experimental measurement there will be some background level. Right? That's coming from cosmic <laughs> rays, from radio radioactive material in the environment, whatever it might be, but there's a background level. There always is. So we'd actually have to subtract that off. That actually is the true position of zero on the y-axis. Right? So you'd always have to subtract that off uh, if you were doing the experiment. So really we need to look at what's that? And about 10 uh, counts in per 30 seconds is the, is the thing. So that's about 0.3 of a count per second on average. So we'd have to take off this value, take it off this value, which is about 170 on this scale. So that drops it to about 160, right? So if we're looking for a half-life, we'd be looking at 80 on the scale, on top of the background. Background is 10, 
So we actually we need to be looking at about this level now to find our half-life. So if we just track across, uh, that's coming out I don't know, around 200 seconds-ish. Yeah? Uh, if we drop it, if we sorry move on by the same sort of uh, spacing, then we're going to be out to this sort of region here. All right, so again, if we look up, we're getting counts of 35, take away 10, 25. <coughs> so we're going down in steps of two all the time for equal periods of time that have passed by uh, in terms of half-lives. Now, these vary enormously, absolutely enormously. Uh, there are some isotopes, the example I've given on there, uh, this isotope of potassium, potassium 40, have a half-life you can measure in billions of years. Um, others, like barium-137, as we've seen from this graph, uh, decay away in, you know, with half-lives in the region of a couple of hundred seconds. Right? And there are others that are much faster than that. There is a huge scale for half-lives, but they're all behaving in the same way in terms of the, of the decay of radioactive nuclei. Um, not sure this one works or not. No, it doesn't anymore, so I'm going to skip it. But there's a lot of animations out there if you want to find them uh, on the internet. Um, I've actually found a good one that I'll put in for next year. I found it yesterday, uh, but didn't have time to swap it over. But if you just put half-life animation into Google, it'll come up with a lot of good stuff. So it's like the simulations I've been showing you for the gas law. Right, there will be a box full of atoms, in this case radioactive atoms, and it will show you the randomised decay of those atoms and what that would look like in terms of the graph that I've just shown you on the previous slide. Now, it's also the case that one radioactive isotope will decay into another isotope which is itself radioactive. And you can end up with long chains um, until you get to something that's stable. So a classic example is uranium-238, right, which has a half-life that's sort of comparable to the age of the Earth. Um, uh, but it decays through a very long chain uh, of processes until it reaches an isotope of lead, which is stable, which doesn't decay anymore. Right, very long process. And if I show you it on this slide, you can see uh, what I mean. <coughs> So we've got atomic number running along the x-axis, right, corresponding to elements in the periodic table, and we've got mass number vertically. Yeah? So if we start with uranium-238 over here, with its half-life of four and a half um, uh, billion years, it decays down to thorium-234. What is that decay process? Alpha. It's an alpha process because we have dropped mass number by four and we have moved our atomic number down the periodic table by two places. So we've lost two protons, we've lost four nuclear particles in total, so the others must be neutrons. This is an alpha decay. Alright, so this first decay is alpha. What about this one along to palladium 234? It's a beta decay, absolutely right. We've not changed the mass number at all, but we have changed the atomic number. The atomic number's gone up by one. Right? So there's a beta decay process. Right? And this one is quite short. This is 24 days half-life. So having waited four and a half billion years, um, we have 24 days as the equivalent half-life for the next step in this process. Um, all right, so we have a beta decay into this one, even shorter half-life, you know, a little over one minute uh, from palladium-234 into another uranium isotope, this time uranium-234. And again, that's at a very long half-life, two and a half billion years. So once we've made uranium-234, a lot of it's going to hang around for quite a long period of time. Okay? And then we have another alpha decay, a whole series of alpha decays, all the way down to here. And then we have some beta decays, and some interesting things happen here. There are different ways, for instance, that 
uh, bismuth 214 can decay. It can either decay through beta emission to polonium 214 or by alpha emission um, to what is that, thallium 210. All right, so occasionally there are isotopes that can decay by different means, and it just depends which one comes first, uh, what decay we actually see. Uh, and then finally, we get down from this polonium-210, um, which is the one we talked about an hour ago, remember, uh, it decays into lead-206. Okay, and that's it. It's stable, end of the chain. So a very, very long process, all the way down, zigzagging down till we get to something stable. So decay chains are actually relatively common. Um, no, I'm not going to bother with that either. Um, one of the things that I wanted to try and finish off with was just to try and add... Uh, I mean, this is not strictly speaking in the syllabus. It's just to try and add a little bit of background um, you know, one of the one of the real problems that we have is talking about radiation. You know, just as we were sort of toying with actually in 027 an hour ago in terms of electromagnetic radiation, talking about it emotively. Um, you know, there are some important emotional, psychological, societal issues associated with radiation, of course, and I'm not trying to minimise those. But there needs to be a voice in that mix, which is the voice that would hopefully come out of a professional physicist, so that you understand where this stuff is coming from, and you can put the risk in some sensible context and measure.